course, it's been 40 years since humans first set foot on the moon. And when we go back, unlike the Apollo missions, we'll have robots to help out. And what we're trying to do is figure out how best to divide the work between humans and robots. Mark Helper is a distinguished senior lecturer at the Jackson School of Geosciences at the University of Texas at Austin. When I caught up with him, he had just returned from a week-long trip to a remote Arctic island. He worked on a NASA-funded project designed to help plan for the eventual return of humans to the moon. Helper flew to Houghton Crater in the Canadian High Arctic. The crater was formed when a large meteorite struck Earth 39 million years ago. In many ways, Houghton Crater is like the moon. It's cold, dry, and dusty, and it lacks any vegetation. It also shares many geological features with lunar impact craters. Helper's job was to imagine he was an astronaut visiting the moon for the first time and trying to learn as much as he could about the geology. To simulate a lunar rover, the team drove a customized Humvee. The driver was Pascal Lee, who, who you can see here with his dog, Ping Pong. Um, this was the one site where I knew I could find the products of the impact. That would be the breaches that are created, maybe even the melt rocks that were created during the impact. So I pretty excited to get to this site, actually get out and begin to look at the rocks here on the ground. So I'm very carefully here examining at various points along the way what's present on the ground and deciding what it is I need to pick up. Once I'd, I'd documented the locality, I'd, I'd uh, bag the rock, a bag usually, in this case I was collecting handfuls of things at the surface to get a grab sample more or less, and then I'd bring them back to the front of the Humvee and put them in the sample collection bin. Whether you're on Earth or on the moon, some things about field work never change. The team was forced to cancel an entire day of field work because of rain. Video crews from media outlets were sometimes distracting. The one day they actually got out for a real traverse, everything came to a screeching halt. It all started when Helper decided to take the Humvee down to what appeared to be a dry creek bed. And, and we got down there and I looked, I got some pictures. Uh, made some notes, turned around, started back to, to our original traverse tracks, and uh, yeah, we got, uh, got bogged down. <laughs> As it turned out, just below a deceptively solid layer of rock, there was a layer of mushy, half-melted permafrost. And it's all ro rock there. You wouldn't think you'd sink very far, but you do, actually. <laughs> As you can see, <laughs> we sink quite far, right to the axles, in fact. At that point, the team decided to break the sim, that's geek speak for break the simulation. They jacked the Humvee up enough to put rocks under the tires and get the frame up off the ground. They put boards behind it and carefully backed it out until it was on firmer ground. The whole incident cost them four hours of field time. That was just a that was just a delay in the game. You, you know, <laughs> those kinds of things happen. You're ready for them all the time. I, I've had lots of experiences where, you know, you, you get delayed for a few hours with that kind of thing, and you just get back on the road and, and continue with what you're doing. To be as realistic as possible, they placed strict time limits on themselves. In one eight-hour traverse, they could spend no more than three and a half hours outside in a spacesuit. That meant Helper would have to do most of his work from inside the vehicle. Instead of getting out, they imagined they had a robotic arm to pick up and examine samples. Helper would radio over to a team member following along on an ATV and request a pickup. I had made a conscious decision to try try to see what I could accomplish without actually getting out um, because I hadn't tried to do that before and I thought with a robotic arm provided to pick up samples that it might be a very effective and efficient way to do things and it turned out to be that way. I could do quite a bit from inside, which I had not done before. That was a very different experience to try to do geology from within a, within a vehicle. So, yeah, so what was that like to walk around? Did, uh, were you able to kind of imagine yourself as being a being on the moon? Yeah, I was kind of surprised. I, th I thought it was a little, uh, <clears throat> you know, a little silly at first because it's not a very high fidelity suit in terms of its characteristics. It's really just a Tyvek suit like I used to wear in the clean lab with a plastic chest and a big plastic helmet on the top. It was about 11 o'clock at night when I finally did get out and walk around. You know, it was kind of uh, very cloudy and kind of gray and, and I'm on this very gray landscape and uh, I'm walking around in this white suit. And <laughs> So yeah, it didn't take long to sort of get the sense that, yeah, I, I can kind of get a sense of what those guys might have been through. 
Helper and his team have now simulated what a human astronaut might be able to accomplish on the moon. Next summer, they'll take a robot to Houghton Crater for a follow-up mission to see what else it can reveal.